All right, now on to the guts of the program, the clinical cases. So sit back and relax or lean, lean forward wrapped as, uh, as we go beyond the fur and feathers and the skin and scales and consider the diseases of multiple species. The first of our clinical cases will be our neuro-oncology case. And I'd like to uh, invite up doctors Peter Dickinson and uh, Albert Lai. Now, the way, the way this uh, is going to work is that we're going to have uh, our veterinarian present his case first. And then, if you'll go ahead and sit down at our conversation table. Wait, you're first. You're first. Um, after you present, Dr. Lai will present. And then you'll both sit down and engage in a conversation. We're going to have, um, there may be spontaneous conversations, some questions prompted by me. And then we have uh, a veterinary internal medicine resident and a uh, human internal medicine resident who will facilitate questions from the audience at the about 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. So uh, very nice to see you here, Dr. Dickinson. Dr. Dickinson is the associate professor, an associate professor of neurology and neurosurgery at the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. And Dr. Lai, who will follow him, is assistant professor at UCLA Neuro-Oncology Program, Department uh, of Neurology here at UCLA. Thank you. This one should work. Okay. Well, thank you. Good morning, everybody. And I'd um, just like to say a big thank you to uh, everybody who organized this conference. It's, uh, it's very exciting for us. I can tell you, for starters, just at breakfast, we've already been hard at it discussing what we can do with this collaborative effort. It, it really is very exciting, and I think um, not just from the veterinary point of view, but from the med human medicine point of view as well. So what I'm going to do is just talk through a case. Um, um, and the idea of this is obviously that, that we're going to show some similarities between the diseases in humans and, and, and domestic species, in this case, the dog. Um, there are differences, and I'll try and highlight some of those as well for you. Some of them are truly medical and biological. Some of them are, are ethical and management-wise. and, and um, I think we can learn from each other on how we deal with all of these issues. So the first case is, this is a, this is a clinic case. It's, it's not meant to be, um, it's not meant to be the gee whiz case. This is what we see in the clinic um, every day at the hospital. Um, it's a four-year-old Rhodesian Ridgeback. This is a dog called Gabby. Um, she presented to us in the clinic. This is a little busy slide I'll run you through. Basically, she presented with seizures, classic generalized seizures. Um, you'd all recognize the human physicians would recognize them. Um, two limb, four limbs all doing tonic-clonic activity, loss of consciousness, um, autonomic activity, very similar. The dog had been treated for a little while um, with um, classic medications. We use very similar medications, in this case phenobarbital, um, potassium bromide, interestingly in dogs, for those who have a neurological background, not used very commonly these days in humans, but actually works very well in dogs. Um, but it came from um, human medicine. And the dog eventually presented to us when clinical science started to progress and go beyond the seizures. And the animal became obtunded, had problems walking, was ataxic, falling, circling to the right, and came into us for an examination. And basically, I'm not going to run you through the whole neurologic examination, but um, decreased mentation, had some postural deficits. Um, a lot of our exam, when we examine these animals neurologically, it's a bit like pediatric neurology. We really can't ask them to count backwards in sevens from 100. Um, it's a pretty basic exam, but the bottom line of this examination was we localized this animal with um, a lesion in the right cerebrum or thalamus, so we, um, a right forebrain lesion. Based on that, um, this will be a point where we'd have a discussion with our owner and say, we think it's probably worthwhile you spending a little bit of your money investigating this further. This dog does not have classic epilepsy. It's not just going to be a medical management. It probably has an underlying cause. So we move forward to diagnostic procedures. They're the same diagnostic procedures um, that we use. Um, we're looking for extracranial causes of seizures. We run chemistries, CBC panels, urinalysis, abdominal ultrasound, thoracic radiographs, all pretty unremarkable. Whatever the cause of this problem was, it was probably going to be within the brain itself. And here's MRI, um, slightly different orientation. Um, I don't know if, do we have a pointer? 
that we can use up here. So just to run you through, MRI, same MRI machines. We use a nice GE 1.5 Tesla magnet, um, same sorts of imaging sequences. Um, our, our planes are a little bit different. This is a, what we call a transverse plane um, in the dog, being a quadruped, an animal having its head um, in a different axis to the humans. But the same sorts of imaging sequences. On the left, you can see a, a T1 and a T1 contrast. And thank you. We see this very nice contrast enhancing, ring enhancing mass lesion. Quite a large fluid component to it. Here's a T2 star. We're looking for hemorrhage. A little bit of hemorrhage associated with periphery of this lesion. It's an intraaxial mass lesion. This is very typical of what we see with primary brain tumors, specifically gliomas. We have a little question here because this one has quite a lot of fluid. One of the other things, the big differentials um, for us and potentially for humans as well with these sorts of lesions is could this be an abscess? Um, this is a nice diffusion weighted imaging. Again, just the comparison, this is sort of standard imaging for most uh, human facilities. And we here see here that there isn't any restriction of diffusion, which would be typical of an abscess, um, which again is going to point us more towards a, a primary brain tumor. Treatment options for this dog, obviously this is a little bit different. Most of our animals don't have insurance. Um, and it's a huge factor we have to think about. This is an expensive trip for these owners. They've already spent $2,500 probably doing the diagnostics when we do MRI. Um, I think it would be a good idea for us to pin on our veterinary school walls some insurance company um, lists of what it actually costs to do all these procedures in human medicine. Because most of our clients, of course, don't realize how much these things cost. Um, would make our job a little bit easier. So here we go. This, we discussed with this, this owner the possible treatment options and a primary treatment option for most cancers. Surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, they're the same procedures that we use in this case. For this tumor, it was fairly reasonable to gain surgical access, and we did a surgical resection. This is a colleague of mine, Dr. Bev Sturgis, who does most of our cranial um, tumor surgery, and we were fortunate that we managed to get a very nice resection of um, this tumor. Um, this goes off to the pathologists, and they do their job, usually from about 10 o'clock to 2 in the afternoon, somewhere around about there. <laughs> I'm only saying that because I know there are no, I'm hoping there are no veterinary pathologists here. <laughs> they, are, they are very good. We, we rely on them very heavily. <laughs> Come on, we're in there at 7 o'clock in the morning, most clinicians, so we're allowed to say that. So here's the pathology on this. And this is the really interesting part as far as I'm concerned. This dog was diagnosed with a glioblastoma multiforme, and this is classic histology for glioblastoma multiforme. This serpentine necrosis, we can see here, pseudopalisading, microvascular proliferation, necrosis, it's GFAP positive. The wonderful thing about this is you could put this in front of a human pathologist. They couldn't tell you whether this is a dog glioblastoma or a human glioblastoma. Uh, we work quite closely with uh, one of the um, pathologists at UCSF is actually a veterinarian. Dr. Andy Boland did his vet degree first. He's a wonderful resource for us. Um, and they're continually amazed at the sort of tumors we see because you can't tell the difference between the canine tumors and the human tumors. So classic glioblastoma multiforme. This is about as bad as it gets. This is Teddy Kennedy's tumor. Um, fatal for most people within 18 months. And the same goes for dogs. It's a bad tumor. What are the options that we have for this dog? Well, surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, fairly standard protocols. There are some experimental protocols now. Here's a little bit of a difference between the dogs and the humans. This dog had surgery, at which point the owners really were out of cash. That's about as far as they can go. We would like to do radiation, but that's another five to $6,000. Chemotherapy, again, gets a little bit expensive in the dog, probably not as expensive as radiation. So this owner made a decision based on realities that they could only... Um, have a surgical resection of this tumor, which is what they did. And the survival for this dog was about a year, which is actually very good for a glioma. That wouldn't be a bad survival, to be perfectly honest, for a human um, with some of the more, these more aggressive tumors. Follow-up, um, surgery was, um, treatment beyond surgery was declined in this animal, went home on typical medications you would expect, anticonvulsants, prednisone for um, edema associated with the tumor in the resection. The dog made a very good recovery. This is really important. It's just as important for us as it is for you uh, as, as human clinicians. This dog has to have good quality of life. There is no point going through this expense and procedure unless we have dog quality of life. Um, fortunately for us, quality of life for a dog means eating, drinking, peeing, and pooing. 
That's our realities. He doesn't have to tie his shoelaces and he doesn't have to play the piano. <laughs> the dog um, was euthanized about a year later, post-surgical resection at the referring vet for status epilepticus. Here's another huge difference when we're talking about using these animal models comparatively. For us, survival is not the end point. Euthanasia is usually the end point, and that can be very different. We were discussing this morning how difficult it can be to get um, some nice data on what is the normal progression of these diseases in animals. And of course, our owners can vary between my dog had a seizure and urinated on my brand new Persian rug, I think it's about time, all the way through to owners that will go all the way through to the bitter end um, and, and, and take every treatment option available. So very different from us, uh, for us than it is for you as when we're talking about survival, because really we're talking about euthanasia. And we don't know with this animal, did his tumor regrow? Um, did the animal, could we have controlled the status epilepticus? This was a decision the owner made not to go any further. And we certainly do have some um, limitations on what we can do um, with our veterinary patients. But I think, as you can see, there are some very strong similarities. And I think you'll see that uh, as Dr. Lai goes through his clinical case as well. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm very delighted to be here, um, and I thank you all for uh, listening. I'm going to talk about uh, the human counterpart, which is uh, glioblastoma, and this is a tumor that I treat. And this is a, a fairly typical case of somebody that is actually alive right now and that I'm um, you know, co-piloting in this journey um, that this patient is taking. So this patient is a 64-year-old uh, right-handed Caucasian female uh, presented with one to two months history of uh, right-sided uh, foot drop, uh, tripping, as well as some increased forgetfulness. She also had some numbness uh, on her right side. Uh, then she developed a uh, seizure, which was uh, inability to speak. This is a transient uh, aphasia. She denied having any headaches, uh, essentially very normal past medical history. Um, she did have a basal cell carcinoma. Um, one thing that's very striking about these patients is when they present in your office, they're, they're very healthy. And, and oftentimes, patients will say, you know, this is the first time I've seen a doctor in 10 years. And, and that's it's very common. And, and this disease is usually isolated to the brain. Uh, glioblastoma is actually the most common type of malignant primary brain tumor. Primary brain tumor means that it's a cell type that originates in the brain as opposed to a metastatic lesion. Uh, approximately, uh, we see approximately 15,000 new cases uh, nationwide every year of glioblastoma. It is in that group of incurable ma malignancies, and a lot of people would say it's one of the most uh, devastating diseases. Uh, it's currently incurable. Um, with life expectancies ranging uh, on average in the 18 to 24 month range. Um, but I have patients that are living beyond 10 years. So we are able to give some hope when we see them initially uh, and try to provide them with the most aggressive treatments. So the neurological examination, uh, this is uh, a complete neurological examination, but the take home point is that she did have some short term memory loss. Uh, otherwise, her mental status was very normal. Uh, cranial nerves uh, were all intact. Uh, on her motor examination, uh, and, and going back to the mental status, uh, there was no aphasia at that time. Um, cranial nerves were intact. Uh, motor examination, uh, she just had some right sided weakness. Um, so all of this starts to localize uh, to the left side of the brain, um, and I'll show you the images of that. Her sensory examination was intact. Coronation, just some issues with tandem gait. Reflexes didn't show anything. Um, we use a functional rating called a KPS, or Karnofsky Performance Score, of approximately 80%, 100% uh, being completely normal. 80% meaning that uh, you are am she is able to ambulate uh, and, and function reasonably well, but does have some neurological deficits. Uh, the clinical course was at, and this is again, um, you know, one of the reasons I selected this case is that it, it is very typical. Uh, so she pre presented to the emergency room. 
uh, and uh, based any ER physician that uh, would detect focality in a neurological examination would generally do an MRI of the brain um, using um, a number of sequences, uh, pre and post contrast as well. And this showed a mass, and I'll show you what that looks like. She was admitted, uh, started on Decadron, which is standard treatment to reduce brain swelling, and AEDs, which are anti-epileptics, uh, with the idea that if she had one seizure that we need to prevent her from having other seizures. Uh, two days later, she had a craniotomy and resection of her tumor. Um, in this case, uh, it was a subtotal resection. Um, one of the difficulties that uh, hamper the uh, optimal treatment of glioblastoma is, is where it is. It's in the brain, and um, there actually is normal function uh, near the tumor as well as interleaved within the tumor. So um, it's not as easy to just say, well, let's just take the whole thing out. Uh, even if we do take the whole thing out, um, it's been clear that the tumor cells are not isolated uh, to the MRI areas of uh, abnormality that actually there are microscopic numbers of tumor cells that have spread with, uh, sometimes into the opposite hemisphere. Um, so localized surgical strategies are, are inadequate. Um, after the surgery, uh, her right-sided weakness persisted. Uh, her right foot numbness improved. Um, uh, she was able to ambulate a little bit better. Um, this is where I think a lot of our discussion with uh, Dr. Dickinson um, will talk about it is, is how are we trying to improve this situation? How are we actually trying to cure patients? And one of the big areas uh, is in biomarker development, um, which is, you know, can we look at the tumor tissue or can we look at the um, uh, patient's germline uh, genome and can we discover uh, risk factors and can we discover things that give us clues as to how to treat a patient? So, um, the pathology was a glioblastoma. Uh, KI-67 is just a measure of aggressiveness of how uh, something, uh, the cells are proliferating. And this is quite high, so it, it, you know, based on the KI-67, 50% of the cells were undergoing cell division. Uh, MGMT, uh, which is a DNA repair enzyme, is, in my opinion, the most robust uh, predictive and prognostic indicator for the treatment of glioblastoma. Uh, in her case, the tumor was unmethylated. The methylated uh, type is actually the better uh, prognostic subgroup, and these separate quite a bit uh, depending on the agent that's given. Also, there's been an emerging story with IDH1. Um, in general, 95% of glioblastomas are IDH1 negative or IDH1 wild type. If she were IDH1 mutant, uh, her prognosis would be expected to be better. Um, and then we also look at uh, epidermal growth factor receptor uh, and a number of other studies um, with the idea that can we actually personalize medicine? Because we think that uh, the, the glioblastoma multiforme, the multiforme a part of that uh, speaks not only to um, the way it looks pathologically, but that it's a very heterogeneously, uh, heterogeneous Gen genetically uh, characterized type of tumor and, and that there may be multiple pathways that, in, in, that are different in different patients and that could be targeted separately. So looking at methods of personalized uh, therapeutics is something that we're looking at and it's, it's going to be based by biomarkers. Uh, so this is imaging. Um, this is called an axial uh, image and on the left side is a T1 image and I think you can appreciate uh, contrast-enhancing cystic lesions. This is a very classic uh, appearance for a glioblastoma, and um, I think we could have predicted this based on localization from the symptoms that it would be on the left, in the left hemisphere. Um, the uh, left hemisphere, as you know, controls the right side of the brain. Um, this area here is involved in, uh, um, um, particularly around here in, in right-sided uh, leg weakness. Uh, afterwards, uh, she had a resection, uh, but in this case, uh, when they did another post-op MRI scan, um, it looked like there was a new area. In fact, with other types of scans, it's, it's not completely a new area. It's a, it's a new appearance, a, a more aggressive appearance in a, in a previously affected area. 
but it just tells you how aggressive this can be. Uh, even when you do everything right, um, the tumor, which appears aggressive, has a high KI67 or high proliferative index, can grow even when all the treatments being scheduled and done at the right time. So, so this is just to show um, she did. Uh, she received what is current standard of care, which is external beam radiation, followed by um, temozolomide, which is this regimen has been in use uh, since 2005. Um, and her tumor was actually uh, stable. Um, unfortunately, she developed neutropenia, persistent neutropenia with uh, the temozolomide, and that's been something that has hampered uh, further use of temozolomide as well as uh, use of other traditional chemotherapies. Um, based on that, we decided because of that new area, we, we sent her for another resection. Um, and, and this time, we achieved what we call a gross total resection. We always think that's a good idea. If we can reduce the tumor burden, we think that uh, outcomes are improved. Because she was persistently neutropenic, um, we decided to give her, which is a Vastin or Bevacizumab, which is really the, one of the hot stories in neuro-oncology. Um, this is particularly uh, useful in her case, even though we had not demonstrated that she failed Temidar, um, but based on her side effects, we were unable to give her more Temidar. So we gave her a Vastin, and she did very well um, on this. Um, just to end on her, so, so I, I just saw her a few weeks ago. Uh, unfortunately, she, and this just tells you about how hard this disease is to treat, she developed um, a side effect of the Avastin, which was that there was a wound healing problem after her craniotomy. Um, Avastin is this uh, drug that uh, is a vascular endothelial uh, um, growth factor inhibitor, and this has many effects, and one of them is in proper wound healing. So she developed a uh, wound healing problem, um, had to be taken back to the hospital, debrided, skin grafts, plastics involved, so it was very bad. And, and so we had to keep her off the Avastin, now I had to put her on something else. So it just, it's, it's just a very tough diagnosis, and um, you know, the reason I'm here and, and why I'm so delighted to be part of this is for very selfish reasons, because I uh, want to get as much as I can out of uh, this to see how I can better treat patients like uh, this one. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dickinson and Lai. And if you guys will go ahead and have a seat, we'll kick off the conversation. Um, I just want to share the process for this conference. In anticipation, months ago, we chose our experts and then we set up a kind of curated conference calls where we introduced, I, I introduced, you know, Dr. Lai, meet Dr. Dickinson, et cetera. And uh, in the case of these two physicians, or doctors and physicians, we, we, uh, I said a couple of things about the, the idea and they just took it away. So, and I just sat there and listened to them. It was wonderful, it was probably, it was wonderful. So what I'd like to start with is a question, how this, series of conversations, these conversations that you've had, has, uh, how, how has it shifted how you think about the disease uh, in your own patients? And then just take it from there, because I know you have a lot to talk about. Well, as I said, the, it's just, you know, a lot of aha moments here. Um, you know, one of the things that I do in, a lot, in addition to taking care of the patients is, is trying to develop new ways to help these patients, you know, based on laboratory uh, studies. So I immediately thought about how to use um, the canine population um, to try to understand more about the disease. You know, glioblastoma is, uh, even though there, there are hundreds of very, very smart people and hundreds of millions of dollars that have gone into initiatives to fully characterize the glio glioblastoma genome, uh, I think we're still very far from understanding, uh, number one, why, why does this arise? And uh, number two, what is the best way to treat these patients? And um, I just started to learn about uh, the unique dog uh, canine genetics and how 
you know, only certain types of dogs uh, get glioblastoma or, or they're enriched in certain dog breeds. And that immediately got me thinking about how you can do gene, genome-wide association studies to actually figure out um, actual pathways using the dog as a model. Um, so, so that was one area that I was very interested in. And we got, we got chatting quite a lot about the genomics. It's a, I mean, for us, the, big, the, the interesting thing talking is how parallel these diseases are, both from pathology, from imaging, from how the patients do, their response to treatment. And I mean, it's de when you think about it, it's, it's quite depressing. I think two treatments in 30 years have been approved by the FDA for glioblastoma, and they've improved survival in terms of weeks to a few months maybe at the most. So one of the big ones for us is, is we see 50% of our gliomas are in three breeds of dog. They're in boxers, Bostons, Bulldogs, and they all have one common phenotype, and that is they look like they've run into a wall. So, <laughs> so all these brachycephalic dogs, there's a story. I've been badgering our geneticists for a long time saying, you've got to find a gene that causes brachycephaly in dogs because there's a story here. 50% um, of our oligodendrogliomas are in boxers. And that's, a, that, that's not a coincidence. That's a genetic predisposition in these breeds of dogs, and that's a huge powerful translational model that we have at our hands to try and look for these, right. what's, what's actually driving these tumors? Where's the oncogenesis coming from? So the dog um, is, is interesting, the only, the only domestic species that really gets these tumors. We don't see them in cats. We were talking this morning, well, those are the questions that most people throw away. We don't see them in cats. We don't want to look at cats. It's almost as interesting to know why don't cats get brain tumors and why do dogs get brain tumors? And the other big advantage we have, of course, with our dogs is that they're an inbred population. Um, we deliberately breed sisters and brothers, which you're not allowed to do, um, for very good reasons. <laughs> the, the dog breeds want to maintain those breed standards, and that's great, but it, 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 it creates problems. Um, it creates genetic drifts, that, which, which cause things like gliomas. Um, and the big advantage of this from a research point of view, if, you know, if we get together, we can do studies in dogs looking, for example, for um, genetic causes of, of glioma, which I will bet my next month's salary, which is getting smaller and smaller thanks to the UCI system. <laughs> I will bet my next month's salary that, that we will find a genetic predisposition in these dogs for glioma. Now, what we hope, of course, is that that is going to be common with human tumors, and that would be fantastic. Even if it's not, it's still um, an insight into biology of these tumors. But just to give you an example of the power of what, what we can do with these dogs, there was a study out of UCSF looking at these genome-wide association studies. So looking at the whole genome and seeing, is there an association, a bit of the genome that maps with brain tumors? That took 1,500 patients. These gene chips cost about $800 a chip. So you can do the math on that as to how much it costs and what's involved with that. We can do the same sort of studies with about 40 or 50 dogs because they're so inbred. Um, so it's a very, very powerful tool. Um, the genetics that we can do on these dogs is hopefully going to be very insightful as to, as to finding causative genes not just genes that are associated with glioblastoma, but real causative genes and, of course, um, breed-related diseases, as with some of the other diseases you'll see today, are, are, are a very powerful model. So I think that, you know, one of the reasons that we, we haven't found a cure for glioblastoma is that it's, it's, it's mainly a sporadic disease. We don't see, um, I have a handful of patients that, um, you know, they may say, well, I have a brother or sister involved, and it's very, very rare. And I think if you look at the history of medicine that, that a lot of diseases has, have, you know, the, the, the causes and, and even treatments have been discovered based on some very informative inbred populations or families. And so I see potentially the, the, the canine model as, as that type of uh, model which, which, which we don't have at this time uh, in humans because it's, because it's a sporadic disease. Um, I think another area, so, so I think there's so much to be learned um, in terms of the causes, what we call gliomagenesis, how do gliomas, how do glioblastoma, how does that actually start? Um, and I think that we, we, we need to do that. Um, the other area, though, is, well, let's say we just let somebody else deal with that. We, we, we have a disease that, that we need to treat, and um, you know, how can we better treat these patients? Um, and I think that's, again, where the dog can be, or canines can be very useful because um, it's, it's a large animal model. And maybe you can talk a little more about how that. Sure. Uh, you know, going back again to the, I think the, 
you know, why, have, why have we had two treatments in 30 years? You know, if you want to read the, 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 the oncology journals, your oncology journals, we must have cured about 4 million mice of brain tumors between, <laughs> between now and, you know, in, in the 1960s and going back. And it, it's, you know, it's, it's a relatively low bar to, to cure a brain tumor in a mouse. Um, now they're not really, they're not really tumors. Mice don't get spontaneous brain tumors very often, very, very low incidence. So we create them, we engineer them, we, put, we transplant cells into immunodeficient mice. You know, and we come up with these wonderful strategies, which are fantastic, but they never seem to make that jump from the laboratory into, into clinical trials. And if you think about it, most of these therapies are going to go from basically rodent models straight into human clinical trials. And that's an enormous leap. That's a big ask to go to make that leap. So one of the things that we've um, been looking at, and, and it's, it's now starting to become a major sort of push for a lot of veterinary schools. The NIH, NIH now has uh, a veterinary oncology consortium that looks at multi-center clinical trials, looking at dog models, not just of, of, of brain tumors, of lots of tumors. If you can imagine the dog as a stepping stone. So if we have a therapy that's very effective in mice, if in the right circumstances ethically and, and everything else, we can use that in a dog. If you have a, a therapy that is effective in a dog brain tumor, it's a real tumor, it's a large volume, it's immunocompetent, it's spontaneous, it's heterogeneous. If you can do something in the dog model, that's probably something that's gonna work in humans. So it, it's a nice translational stepping stone to a much more realistic model of disease. Uh, and one of the other things, of course, that we can do is, is there are lots of things and questions we can ask in these dog clinical cases that we can't ask with humans. One good example would be we don't have as many standard therapies. We have owners that are restricted in what they can do. Um, we can do clinical trials in animals from an ethical point of view. We can offer treatments to owners. We can offer quality of life to these dogs. And we don't have to necessarily do standard of care. We can look at experimental um, drugs and, and, and things. And then we can see if those are going to be effective or not. And we, those trials are already ongoing. So it's a powerful model. It's a model you've got to ask the right questions with. And we discussed this morning about, you know, we can't order 50 dogs from Jackson Labs with brain tumors. These are real tumors in real dogs. They're people's pets. They're part of their families. You've got to treat them like human patients in, in, in a parallel sort of way when we're talking about these trials. But there are lots of things and questions we can certainly ask using these dogs as models of tumors. So it's, it's a powerful model, but it's, a, it's one where we have to sit down and we have to work out what we can both get out of this. I think that's one of the great things about talking to people in these sorts of environments is there's lots and lots of people who'll come here today and say, I've got a great idea, that's really cool, we can do that, and then three months later, nothing's happened. I think about, about, out of about 100% of these questions, there'll be about 5% where you'll suddenly find that I can ask a question that I want to ask you can ask a question that you want to ask, and that synergy comes together, and it goes forward, and people keep doing it. Um, that's, what I, that's why I like doing these things. That's why I think it's exciting to talk to, to human clinicians. They provide us with opportunities, with materials, with expertise, and we can provide things in the opposite direction. And when that synergy comes together, um, you can do some pretty amazing things. Great. Well, I, thank you. That's I mean, absolutely fascinating. And um, I, I, excuse me. Wonderful, fascinating, and we, I, I would love to hear the two of you continue. When I introduced them over the telephone, um, they started talking, and I was really a, a third party, and uh, at midway of the conversation, they said, well, we have to get together on Saturday after the conference and have more of this conversation. So that was very exciting for me to hear. I just want to point uh, something out that your conversation touches on, which I did not know um, prior to my, my voyage, uh, the extent to which veterinarians reach into results of human clinical trials to the, the, the human literature to treat their patients. Again, an obvious point to veterinarians, but I don't, I suspect many physicians and maybe even some investigators, and I'm quite certain that most patients who are considering uh, entering clinical trials are not aware of the fact that their, their generosity in, in participating in these things um, will benefit not just other generations of humans, but other animals. So I think that's kind of an important point, which I, I personally hadn't been aware of. Um, we'd like to take some questions from the audience now. So we have uh, Julio and Cynthia, Drs. Lopez and Chung, I should say, uh, who are available. And they're going to select the people. The, the idea of having an intermediate step to do clinical trials seems very important because there's such a huge cost and risk and uncertainty to pharma when they look at prospects to bring it to the clinic. And as you say, the uh, it, uh, a, a natural uh, 
disease in, in a dog is much more appealing than a made-up model in, in the mouse. So my question is, um, it would seem, rather than going to the NIH, that one would want to go to Pfizer or BMS or other companies that are in this space and are looking for a consortium of um, uh, a, a veterinary clinical consortia to be able to, in an organized way, do trials on, uh, in a timely fashion with a, a population of, uh, of dogs at risk. So is, it po is there such a consortium that's being formed, and is that and has there been any interest or possibility of speaking to pharma about it? Um, so I, everybody got the question now. You know, there actually is a consortium there now. The NIH have actually um, had an initiative, and there is a veterinary oncology consortium, and they run multi-center clinical trials very similar to the human consortiums. Um, I will say, to my chagrin, that the brain tumors weren't included in that. Um, we're the orphan tumor, I think a little bit like the orphan tumor in the human oncology world, brain tumors. So we're not involved in that, and it's one of the issues trying to get multi-center trials up and going. Pharma is, uh, um, is working with, I think, NIH. Um, we certainly um, do work with pharma. Pharma has, they have their issues, and they come at things from a very different angle. And I think the key here is that um, you're quite right. You've got to get these things done in a timely fashion. If you're going to put yourself up as a model, to do certain things, you've got to be very careful you're asking the right questions. So I think certainly for the brain tumor point of view, we will never be able to do, I don't think, you know, 50 dogs with glioblastoma control, 50 dogs with this. We're not going to have those sorts of numbers or be able to follow those through. You've got to ask specific questions. And I think um, rather than doing um, mass screening of, of therapies, I think looking at promising therapies and asking specific questions that are limiting therapies. I think it's probably going to be more the valid way to use this dog model. But uh, we do talk to pharma, and they are very interested, and a lot more people are getting a lot more interested as we can see it becomes feasible. And some of that is just the advances veterinary science has made in the last 10 years. You know, 10 years ago, most, most people didn't have an MRI. Now MRI is standard in private practice, private referral practices. Um, radiation therapy, brain biopsy is becoming more standard through most practices. We now have the tools that we can actually perform some of these clinical trials in a realistic way. I think, I, think, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, one of the things that I've um, been intrigued with and have, have uh, worked on for the past number of years is in human medicine, the NIH does have a list, and anybody in this room, anybody in the country can find out what clinical trials are being done where uh, and with what type of results so that every clinical trial has to be registered. This is not something that occurs in veterinary medicine. And I, I strongly think that we, the leaders, need to advocate registration of every single clinical trial that exists in veterinary medicine. We need to know if it goes on. We need to know if it works. We need to know if it doesn't work. And we don't want pharma or any other company or any other group to negate the results and the findings of those trials. So I think you're absolutely right. And I think because of the dispersion of the veterinary schools, you know, particularly into relatively small rural communities. You know, this is going to take work that requires you and your group leading it with private practitioners in specialty areas and then developing um, a system on the web so that clients can find out. And if your dog in Roanoke, Virginia has a glioblastoma, they know to get a hold of you and to find out how a clinical trial or how they can enter their pet into a clinical trial. The web is a wonderful thing, <laughs> <coughs> or a bad thing if you're a clinician. <laughs> would you, uh, by the way, would people introduce, say whether they're a veterinarian or a physician or what your background yeah. is? Mark Rishnu, I'm a veterinarian up at Cornell in uh, Ithaca, New York. I have a question going back more to the science of the discussion here, um, and that was an observation that I made when Dr. Lai had mentioned that the glioblastomas in humans tend to be, have a very heterogeneous expression profile. In other words, they're genetically diverse tumors and suggesting multiple idiopathologies to this disease. And then Dr. Dickinson comes out and says, well, we see 50% of them in brachycephalic breeds, which would, in the simplistic viewpoint of a geneticist, suggest, well, maybe it's a monogenetic trait that just simply expresses itself differently. Now, do you see that as a difference 
between the two diseases, or is there something here that, um, that what you see at the end point may still come from a single cause? I think realistically that, that it's going to be much more the human story. I think what we're looking at is a very, we're looking down a very narrow alleyway at our dog tumors. I suspect they're going to be heterogeneous. Plenty of dogs that are not brachycephalic get glioblastomas and other gliomas. I think what we're going to find maybe when we look at these inbred populations that have predispositions, we may find one common um, factor which predisposes. Boxers are a very interesting breed. We have Dr. Fellman, who's one of the um, um, internists at, da at Davis, has a, has, a, a very, has a phrase that he says, um, boxer is French for cancer. You know. <laughs> they get a lot of tumors, not just gliomas. Um, so I, I think it's going to be, I think we have the, the inbred dogs gives us a tool to pick out something. I don't think it's going to be the whole story. I think it would be a little naive to think we're, we're going to find the cure for brain glioma by finding out what causes um, glioma in brachycephalic dogs. But I think it's a, a way to get back to the basic science. I think it's, it's, it's an interesting one when we talk about um, you know, cancer. Once cancer occurs, the barn door is open and everything comes into the barn. And that's what we're looking at when we do our genetic studies. I think being able to get right back to the beginning of saying what is a potential trigger which there obviously is in these dogs, there's something predisposing them, might allow us to get back to some of the more causative genes as opposed to the sort of the bystanders. And it's difficult looking through that pool of bystanders. When you look at the literature, and there's another paper out every week on upregulation of X, Y, Z, P, Q, D, you name it. It's upregulated in tumors, but is it really causative? So I think that's the exciting bit. I don't think it's going to be everything, but I think it's a way to get back to the beginning on some of the causative genes. And they may be totally different <coughs> in dogs. Yeah, if I could add to that, when, when we talk about the genetic heterogeneity in glioblastoma, there was, you know, the Cancer Genome Atlas, they did a very comprehensive look at the genetics of glioblastoma. And even though it's heterogeneous, it's not completely heterogeneous. So they actually found that they could group uh, glioblastoma. They, they all looked histologically the same, but when they looked at them molecularly, they actually fell into groups, subgroups, either with... Uh, RB gene problem, uh, EGFR amplification, uh, NF2. So I would maybe hypothesize that, that in the box, in, in one of these, that, that maybe it would be more homogeneous, but it would mimic that, that something that would eventually be found in the canines in a particular breed might, instead of having five pathways of gliomogenesis, that there may actually be only one. And I think that would be very interesting to figure that out. And then you could actually use that model to target. Because what happens when we, you know, even in a tumor where we have a category we feel like, oh, it's EGFR related, what, what can happen is that if you, we have some EGFR uh, inhibitors, but um, the tumor is seemingly able to develop a resistance mechanism. So this may actually, if, if the, you know, a resistance mechanism use, utilizing one of these other pathways, even though that wasn't what caused it originally. So this may actually, you know, provide an avenue where there's only one molecular pathway aberration and that, that could be looked at and, and figured out. We do, we do see heterogeneity in our tumors if we look at them genetically. I think the thing, maybe one thing about the gliomas is that once the pathway is started, they can shoot off in multiple pathways, and that's where your heterogeneity <coughs> may come from. So I think the, the, the barn analysis, which I heard from um, David Gutman, who's a, um, a researcher um, looking at meningiomas, and he's, he gave this wonderful analogy of the barn, that your normal barn, if it's your cell, has two chickens, two horses, two cows, two ducks. When we go in as oncologists and look at these tumors, the door's already open, and we look inside there, and there's an elephant, three chickens, you know, two cows, and the ducks have just gone. You know? And the question is, did, you know, when the door, barn doors got open, did they all, everybody run in and run out? Or is that what actually happened in the barn in the initial place? And, and that's what we've got to get to the bottom of. That's, I think, where the power of the model is. We're going to go ahead and have to, we're going to stop for, for our coffee break. I just want to mention one thing for the MDs. I'm sure the vets know about this. If you go to the National Cancer Institute website uh, for the, with the, at the uh, Comparative Oncology Program, there's a list of uh, clinical, some clinical trials. It was, it was just fascinating to take a look at uh, the kinds of pro projects that are uh, ongoing. So that just might be an interesting thing to take a look at. We're going to break, and uh, for about 15 minutes or so, we're going to start again uh, with our cardiology section at 10 o'clock. So uh, go ahead, get Use the bathroom, get something to drink and eat.